Hi everybody, welcome back to the Feynman Technique. Um, today I've got an integral that is uh, inspired by an integral that I got off the channel Maths 505. Um, the only difference is he evaluated this integral from 0 to 1, I will be evaluating it from 0 to infinity. And of course I will be using Feynman integration. So since we're doing Feynman integration, we'll use our typical first step, which is to reparameterize it to make it a function of t. So um, you can see all I did was replace this square root of 2 with a t. And now we'll notice that if we evaluate our function at the point uh, square root of 3, t is equal to square root of 3, we'll get 0 because we'll just end up with natural log 1, uh, which is 0, and the integral over any uh, interval of 0 is just 0. Um, and we'll also note that f evaluated at the point square root of 2 is um, what we're trying to find. So that's equal to i. All right, so next we utilize the Leibniz or Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign, which says that we can take the derivative with respect to t of our function of t right here directly by taking the partial with respect with respect to t of the integrand uh, and leaving the rest alone. So you'll see that's what I did right here. Um, we have 1 over this right here, which is basically just the reciprocal of this, that's right here, times the derivative with respect to t of this, which is, is right here, times 1 over x. Okay. Now, simplifying, this is what we get. We have f prime of t is equal to uh, this thing right here. That's negative integral 0 to infinity of 1 over 1 minus tx plus x squared dx. Now, that's not a super easy integral to evaluate um, or a simple antiderivative to take, um, but it's absolutely doable with uh, techniques that you would learn in calculus 1 or 2. Um, or calculus a, b, and b, c. Uh, all you do, you complete the square, uh, do some algebra, make some substitutions, and you can you can arrive at an you can get the antiderivative to that. Um, I'm not going to be showing the um, individual steps required to take that antiderivative since that's not really what this channel is about. But here's here's what you get: the antiderivative with respect uh, to x of this right here is equal to this. Again, not super easy to do, but 100% doable with standard techniques. Okay, so now we have the antiderivative. Uh, so now we need to evaluate it at the bounds, which are zero and infinity. And this is what you get. So eventually, um, all in all, we end up with f prime of t um, is equal to this. If you plug in infinity uh, into this, you'll see that this is simply um, arctangent of infinity, which is pi over 2, um, which would cancel this 2, and we just get pi over square root of 4 minus t squared. Um, and then if we evaluate it at the point 0, um, you'll see that this 2x just drops out. We bring the negative outside since arctangent is an odd function, and this is what we end up with. Okay, so now we have f prime of t. Um, we're not interested in f prime of t. We want f of t. So we have to anti-differentiate this. Um, so we have that f of t is equal to this antiderivative right here. Now this one, um, this one's a fairly standard one. This is going to be some form of the, um, the arc sine function. Now this one might look tricky at first, but it's actually 100% solvable with the substitution u is equal to arctangent t over square root of four minus t squared. It just works out. So make that substitution and um, you can totally do that antiderivative. In any case, this is what you end up with. Again, I'm not gonna be showing the steps to do that. Um, you can, you can totally do that with standard techniques in Calculus 1 and 2. 
but this is what you end up with. Our f of t is equal to minus pi arc sine of t over 2 minus the arctangent squared of t over the square root of 4 minus t squared. And then, of course, plus c. All right, and now comes the time when we utilize these, uh, this fact right here, that f evaluated at the square root of 3 is equal to 0. All right, so let's do that. So we have f evaluated at the square root of 3 is equal to 0, which in turn is equal um, to this thing uh, when t is equal to square root of 3. So we have 0 is equal to this. And that means that c is equal to this. Now, arc sine of square root of 3 over 2 is pi over 3. And the arc tangent of square root of 3 is also pi over 3. So we end up with pi squared over 3 plus pi over 3 all squared. That evaluates to 4 pi squared over 9. Great. So now that we've, we have found C, we just plug it back into our f of t, because now we have C. It's equal to... Um, 4 pi squared over 9. So now this becomes our f of t. And now all that's left to do is plug in square root of 2 for t, and we have i, which is the value we wanted to find. So let's do that. We know that i is equal to f evaluated at the point t is equal to square root of 2. So we replace all our t's with square root of 2. So we have minus pi arc sine of square root of 2 over 2 minus arc tangent squared of, this actually evaluates to 1. We'll have square root of 2 over the square root of 4 minus square root of 2 squared. Square root of 2 squared is 2. 4 minus 2 is 2. So we have square root of 2 over square root of 2, which is just 1. And then, of course, plus 4 pi squared over 9. Now, arc sine of square root of 2 over 2 is pi over 4, as is arc tangent of 1. So this is what we have. Now, simplifying that, we have i is equal to five pi, uh, negative 5 pi squared over 16 plus 4 pi squared over 9. Um, that, uh, taking a common denominator of 144, we have that i is equal to negative 45 pi squared over 144 plus 64 pi squared over 144, which evaluates to 19 pi squared over 144. So that is the answer to this integral that we started with. It is equal to 19 pi squared over 144. Kind of a strange answer, but anyway, that's what it is. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and we will see you next time.